Hello and welcome back to History for the HSC. It has been quite a while since our last video, but today we are going to be continuing with our series into the core modern history topic of power and authority in the modern world. And today, specifically, we're going to ask the question of what impact that this party that supposedly represented the workers of Germany actually had on those very workers. So, in today's video, we're going to continue studying the same syllabus stop point that we've been looking at for a little while now. It tells us we look at the impact of the Nazi regime on life in Germany, including cultural expression, which we've done already, religion, again we've covered, workers, youth, women, and minorities, including Jews. As I've said, we've already posted videos on the impact of the regime on cultural life and religion, and today, obviously, focusing on the third option, workers. Now, in discussing the various elements at play here, we're also going to be touching lightly on points relevant to the initial consolidation of Nazi power. However, that will not be a focus. So with that said, let's break this down. So as usual, there are lots of different ways that we could break down this, this specific uh, dot point. However, today we're going to look at the following elements. Firstly, the impact of the regime on the Communist Party and on communism within the Reich. Secondly, the abolition of trade unions and the development of the German Workers' Front as a replacement of them. Thirdly, the creation of the Reich Labour Service, or RAD, as a means for the youth to contribute to the state through manual labor. And finally, Kraft durch Freude, the Kraft durch Freude program, aimed at incentivizing the workforce to support the Reich's industrial and military demands. And so with that framework set up, let's get going. So we know already that despite being a party that said it represented the workers, the Nazis made no secret of their hatred and their desire to destroy the movement of communism in Germany. There were, in reality, many communist and socialist groups in Germany during the Weimar years. The largest party in the majority of this time was indeed the left-leaning Social Democrats. However, the KPD, or Kommunistische Partei Deutschland, or the Communist Party of Germany was the most well-known and politically powerful communist party, as opposed to just socialist party. And indeed, outside of the Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union, it was this communist party in Germany, in Weimar Germany, that held the most political sway in any country in all of Europe. It was this group that Lenin and other leading Bolsheviks looked to as the next potential sources source of a revolution, a revolution they thought would then bring support to the Bolsheviks in the ongoing civil war in Russia. Now, the KPD was formed in January 1919, uh, a uniting a union of a variety of different left-wing groups, including most famously the Spartacists. Uh, they would even take part in the failed Spartacist uprising, which we discussed in an earlier video on the collapse of the Weimar Republic. You can possibly see a link on the screen now. And initially, the Communist Party had desired an immediate revolution in much the same way that the Bolsheviks had. But as time went on, the party, the Communist Party in, in, in Weimar Republic became slightly more moderate, and they chose instead to take part in the Reichstag and in the Weimar Republic. And so from 1924 onwards, they found a reasonable amount of success in democratic uh, processes and being elected to the Reichstag. Ironically, in this, they would share some similarities in ideals with the Nazi party, as can be seen in this particular election poster. Both the Nazis and the communists agreed with the desire to limit the power of the social democrats and a redistribution of wealth from those they believed had been had unfairly benefited from the exploitation of others. Hitler had his 25-point plan, which called out 
uh, war profiteers and called for various socialist-like elements in what was, after all, a national socialist party. And indeed, throughout the early 1930s, the KPD would at least politically cooperate with the burgeoning Nazi movement in attacking the Social Democrats. This, however, would not last. Clashes between Nazi branches and communist, uh, what were called Red Front fighters, were a common scene, as the two clear the two parties had clear ideological differences. The Communist Party would continue, however, to poll well throughout the various elections to the Reichstag during the Weimar period. From the 2% of the vote that they received in 1920, they would quickly become one of the major parties in the Reichstag on a consistent basis. The May 1924 elections would result in 13% of the seats in the Reichstag going to the KPD. In December the same year, a slight decline to just 9% before a steady climb as Germany raced towards the Great Depression. 11% in 1928, 13% in 1929, slightly over 14% in July 1932 as the Nazis became the leading party in the state, before reaching a height of around 17% in November 1932. But it would be what happened following this election and Hindenburg's invitation to Hitler to form a government, because in February 1933, the Reichstag building would be set on fire by Dutch communist uh, Marinus van der Lubbe. And we discussed this in an earlier video on the consolidation of power. Again, there's a link hopefully on the screen now. But what we need to understand at this point is whether or not this was a plot by the Nazis the whole time, or whether or not the communists planned it, or whether or not Marinus uh, acted of his own volition, the reality is the Nazis used it as a way to target the Communist Party. The Reichstag Fire Decree would be signed into effect by President Hindenburg using Article 48, and the Nazi Party would ruthlessly target and attack the leading mem members of the KPD, convinced that they lay behind the fire, or at the very least willing to use the fire as a convenient excuse to eliminate political enemies. Goering, as Minister for the Interior of Prussia, held control over the police of the state, and it was here that the attacks on the Communist Party were most violent. That is, here in Prussia. Somewhere in the order of 10,000 members of the Communist Party would be arrested and sent to the newly opened Dachau concentration camp. This violence and repression would continue uh, and spread throughout Germany and to the rest of the Reich. Officially, the KPD continued to exist despite these attacks. It, they managed to achieve some 12% of the votes in the March 1933 Reichstag elections, but uh, in the aftermath of the Reichstag fire, these newly elected Communist Party representatives were never able to take their positions, and the party would be banned the day after the election on the 6th of March. Hitler would use his new majority, not having redistributed the seats that the Communists won, to ensure that the Enabling Act would pass. Many of the Communist Party leaders would be imprisoned throughout the war. Others would flee to the Soviet Union, hoping to find safety. Some of those would be caught up in Stalin's purges in the 1930s. And whilst the party would continue to exist in some form or another, a minor underground form largely throughout the Nazi era, there would never really be a credible opposition. For their part, the Nazi attacks on communists would continue. Propaganda posters would attempt to continually turn the people against communism. And with the party's leadership decimated and any still willing to oppose them imprisoned, the Nazis went to great lengths to convince German communists of the errors of their ways. That being said, they would never fully disappear. And following the war, the KPD would reappear reappear, sorry, in both East and West Germany. In East Germany, under Soviet pressure, it would quickly become the leading power, although it would be renamed. The party did find less success in West Germany, where it received some minor support in the first West German elections, but the advent of the Cold War and the atrocities carried out by Soviet Red Army soldiers severely hindered their popularity, and they would lose their final seats in the West German parliament in 1953 before being banned outright. In 1956.
A second important consideration to understanding the impact of the Nazi regime on life comes with the advent of the German Workers' Front. The Nazi Party had a long history of anti-union action. Indeed, as early as March 1933, SA members uh, had already began attacks on union headquarters, even killing some union members. By the 2nd of May, this had become official government, Nazi government policy with the abolition of trade unions. Their headquarters, that is trade union headquarters, were taken over, their funds uh, confiscated, their leaders arrested. These attacks were undoubtedly a result of Nazi party ideological belief and their desire to remove what they really considered to be part of the threat of Marxism, of communism in Germany. And in its place, the Nazis would set up the German Labour Front or Deutsche Arbeit Front under the leadership of Robert Ley. On the surface, the German Workers' Front was supposed to replace the need for unions. However, their goals and the goals of unions were really far apart. Hitler had banned collective bargaining and strike action. Indeed, the front aimed to enforce the control of factory owners over their workers rather uh, than looking out for the needs of their workers. The German Workers' Front aimed to build Volksgemeinschaft to allow the state to achieve the level of autarky that they desired. Despite the reality on the ground, Nazi propaganda and the Nazi propaganda machine went into full swing, attempting to convince the people that the Nazis and German Workers' Front were indeed pursuing the betterment of German workers. This included the Strength Through Joy program, as we'll discuss later, and co-opting national holidays, such as the traditional May Day holiday. Propaganda also encouraged the belief that the Nazi party was solving the unemployment issues, which, which contributed to the downfall of Weimar. At its height in 1932, over 31% of the population of Germany was unemployed. And the reality is that under the Nazis by 1938, this figure, unemployment figure, had dropped to essentially zero. But how was this achieved? Well, the removal of Jews and other undesirables from working population, and a distinct policy of rearmament in contravention of the Treaty of Versailles, which employed millions upon millions. As the historian Richard Evans argues, Hitler's boast that he would solve the unemployment problem within four years of taking office seemed to have been triumphantly justified. Incessant Nazi propaganda boasting that the battle for work was being won gained widespread credence. It helped win over many doubters and skeptics to the government side from May 1933 onwards and pumped new euphoria into the Third Reich's supporters. But the reality for the worker was that wages actually declined during the Third Reich period. However, Nazi propaganda would focus instead on the higher amounts of annual income of the German worker, a byproduct of significantly increased working hours whilst wages per hour actually decreased. Yet another sign that the German workers' front was not interested in workers' rights, but in fact interested in implementing Nazi policy and ideology. As Robert Ley, head of this German workers' front, would put it, look at the workers. Look with me into Germany's factories. I might remind some in this room what they thought three years ago, not only about their party or the government, but their whole view of life, the views of labor, the fatherland, their people, their community, or about socialism. They will have to agree that they are of entirely different opinions today. Now, measuring the success of the German Workers' Front really then depends on from whose perspective we consider it. In terms of the perspective of the worker, it highlights the fundamentally negative ad, uh, impact sorry, that the Nazi regime had on workers' lives. But in terms of how it was portrayed through propaganda and how it would seem most Germans at the time seemed to view it, it was highly successful and positive to German workers. Another important organization that developed in Nazi Germany at about this time 
was the Reich Labour Service. The RAD found its beginning indeed in the years prior to the Nazi takeover of power. In fact, it was under the chancellorship of Brüning in the Weimar Republic that an organization had been created called the Voluntary Labor Service in July 1931. It was a means to create employment as Germany lurched through the Great Depression. Indeed, uh, the creation of this group at the time had been one of the changes implemented in the Republic using the infamous Article 48. And when Hitler came to power, he seized upon this organization as a group that could aid in stemming the tides of unemployment and probably more importantly, in assisting developing Gleichschaltung and coordination or more correctly, Nazification of the state. More than just co-opting this existing organization, Hitler wanted to do more. Specifically, he wanted to develop it into a Nazi instrument within the Nazi state. And, and as such, uh, the state spent a lot of money funding the organization. And although those who would be conscripted would be members would not be paid, operating the Reich's, uh, Reich's labor service cost the state quite a lot of money. All of this would be codified into law through the Reich Service Act of June 26, 1935, which stated, the Reich Labor Service is an honorary service to the German people. All young Germans of both sexes are obliged to serve their people in the Reich Labor Service. The Reich Labor Service is to educate the German youth in the spirit of National Socialism to the national community and to the true working attitude. Above all, the due respect of manual labor. And the Reich Labor Service is intended for the performance of charitable work. Now, this organization was indeed incredibly effective in reducing unemployment, but it was also fundamentally tied to Nazi ideology, as you can kind of get from the third point there in the law. The youth of Nazi Germany were to indeed be indoctrinated and trained to serve their community in a practical, tangible way that echoed the call of Volksgemeinschaft. Battalions were created, and the whole organization functioned much like an army, with the young conscripts being moved to live in barracks, supplied with a bicycle to get around and a shovel to work with. Uniforms, military-like uniforms to wear, and with this, they would dedicate some 72 hours a week of work unpaid to the fatherland. With military service a compulsory, compulsory reality for young men, German men, their future path was then clear. All males between 18 to 25 would first enter the RAD for a period of six months service, after which time they could then serve their compulsory two years service in the Wehrmacht, the German army. Initially, the labor service carried out uh, work to ready farmland, to reclaim marshland, to repair and build dikes, to, to build roads. However, as Hitler's aggressive policy goals came into fruition, the RAD was increasingly used as a quasi-military force to help support the actions of the army itself. From supporting the army during the Anschluss with Austria in March 1938, to the occupation of the Sudetenland and later the rest of Czechoslovakia, and then into the war itself, where RAD troops would be put to work building fortifications on both the Eastern and the Western Front. When war itself broke out, a large portion of the RAD was immediately drafted into the army proper, although the organization would continue to remain a proving ground, a testing ground for young German men and women prior to entering the army proper. But as the war drew to a close and the situation in Germany grew more and more serious, the line between the RAD and the army became increasingly blurred. But even with this blurring, we can still see the nature of Nazi ideology. The German citizen was to support the state. And while workers were important to achieving that, soldiers were far more so. The last element of the Nazi government's impact on workers we want to consider is the Kraft der Freude program, or the Strength Through Joy program, the logo of which was on the title screen today. Now, it actually 
operated as part of the German Workers' Front, but it served a very kind of different role. The Strength Through Joy program was essentially a, a form of propaganda designed to convince the masses of the benefits uh, of the difficulties that they face in their daily working life. It aimed to promote Nazism by subsidizing leisure activities and holidays, and as such, to aid in the development of this German Volksgemeinschaft. Now, one way it did this was through the promotion of cheap holidays. By 1939, the KDF program, as it was called, had become the world's largest tourism company. In 1934, some 2.3 million Germans took KDF holidays. By 1938, there were 10.3 million holiday makers taking a KDF holiday. And one of the places they might have wanted to go was the Colossus of Prora, the Nazi holiday resort on the north coast of Germany that was still in mid-construction when war broke out. Designed by Albert Speer, Speer sorry, with some uh, information being given by Hitler himself, Prora was have to have rooms five meters by 2.5 meters with some two beds each and some simple in-room facilities. Each and every room in the whole hotel would face the sea. A massive construction that would sleep some 20,000 people each night with a giant indoor arena large enough to fit each and every one of those 20,000 visitors. but a hotel that in the end would never be completed. Another way the KDF program hoped to sell this middle-class life to German citizens who were not seeing any real rise in wages was through subsidized cruises on one of the six specifically built cruise ships. More than just internal propaganda to German workers, these cruises actually offered international propaganda a way of showing off the Nazi state to the world. And in reality, despite being heavily subsidized uh, as a means of attracting the lower class German worker, the reality was the majority of those who went on a KDF cruise came from a middle class German background. The KDF program also famously developed the People's Receiver, a cheap radio that was so essential to Goebbels' propaganda campaign. But perhaps, it was their attempt to build a car, the KDF wagon, that was the most extreme example of their attempts to sell a reality that just did not exist. As you look at this photo showing Hitler looking at a model of this wagon, you might realize it looks familiar. And this is because, of course, the KDF wagon is none other than what got released later as the Volkswagen Beetle. Hitler demanded a car that could be bought by a German worker for under a thousand marks. And this was in fact a price that was just not possible at the time. And indeed production of the cars never really went into full effect. With wartime rationing, the reality is that not one single individual member of the German Reich was ever able to buy one. So much of the Strength Through Joy program was little more than propaganda. The cars were not built, the cruises rarely taken, the holiday resorts unfinished. What remained was far more modest. Tennis classes, performances, gymnastics, theater. This indeed was the tangible reality of the Strength Through Joy program. The rest remained far out of reach of the German worker and in the end was little more than Nazi propaganda. This has been History for the HSC and our latest deep dive into the power and authority topic. Today, we have seen that the, the impact that this regime had on the workers, the impact that these national socialists had on the people it purportedly represented. From their attacks on the communists and trade unions to the enforcement of what was effectively conscription via the RAD, along with attempts to build support through the Strength Through Joy program, a program that would largely exist in the imaginations of its creators and the people of Germany. Now remember, you can download this end screen as a poster. Another one of our videos and the subscribe buttons appearing on the screen right about now, if you wanna look at either of those. Now next time, 
we're going to continue to work our way through this dot point, looking at the impact of the regime, specifically what impact they had on the youth of, Reich, of the Reich. But until then, keep studying.